Welcome to a special edition of Urban World News here on the Jericho Broadcasting Network. Joining me is our CEO and our lead producer, Roy Evans, for this uh, special conversation. And also joining me today is Ms. Cora Faith Walker, former legislator, state legislator for Missouri. She had the district, Ferguson, she was in the 74th district, better known as Ferguson in the state of Missouri. She currently now works for St. Louis County as a staff member for the uh, county executive for St. Louis County. Ms. Walker, how are you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm doing, I'm doing about as well as you can be with everything that's going on, but thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate being able to come on this morning. You know, this is a little bit of a treat for me. Normally, my focus is on sports, HBCU sports, and how society, uh, how HBCUs affect society through the world of sports. But the things that have been happening lately have bled over from sports into, into the real world and from the real world into sports. You know, we've seen some uh, prominent coaches come out with uh, various statements. Roger Goodell uh, yesterday. Uh, the NFL came out with a video. Something. Get, yeah. <laughs> you know, the NFL has come out with a statement. You had the multiple, uh, multiple uh, NFL athletes come out with statements. You even had Nike come out with a commercial earlier this week, uh, you know, downplaying uh, everything that's going on. Since, since my sp focus a lot is on sports, I'm going to start off right there. What do you think about the world of sports as they're bleeding over into – real real world politics as i like to call it yeah yeah no i think that's that's a really really good question and you know um there was a lot of uh a lot of athletes i'll say that came out this week um and made statements um some good uh some that were just trash let's just be very honest um i'm looking at you drew drew Brees. um but you know i think one of the things that's important to remember at the end of the day athletes are people too um, and oftentimes, um, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to be black men or black women or whomever first and foremost, you know, that doesn't change just because they put on a uniform, um, to play sports. And so, you know, there were a couple of people who, um, were commenting on the fact that like LeBron James is speaking out and some other people were speaking out and saying that, uh, they should just stick to stick to sports. And, um, I think that that's incredibly, uh, misinformed at best um, to, to expect something like that from people who, um, you know, when, when athletes are people and, and um, that's something that, that shouldn't be lost in all of this. Um, you know, I, I did also see Roger Goodell's statement or video yesterday. And quite frankly, I found it to be inadequate. Um, it would have been much easier for him to just say, I'm sorry, Colin Kaepernick and leave it at that. I would have felt much better about that. They didn't even mention the man's name. And all the flack and, I mean, he's black, he's been blackballed. Um, and it just felt like a little, you know, too little, too, too late. But there is one thing that he did say. And, um, you know, I, uh, I commented on it and I actually uh, um, add, uh, I mentioned the NFL uh, Players Association on it. He said, uh, without black players, there would be no National Football League. And I'm like, you know, that's pretty instructive. And that's, I think that's something for, for, uh, for folks to consider. You know, we've got power um, in protests and there are all kinds of different ways that, uh, that you know, protests can happen. Um, but, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, I just, I, I, I find some of these statements pretty ironic when, um, when they, were, they were giving Colin Kaepernick so much hail and so much trouble for non-violently protesting. I'm trying to make a distinction between non-violent and peaceful, but non-violently protesting um, the way that he did in order to bring, aware bring awareness to, um, to police brutality. Roy. Well, you know, I, I, I find it to be uh, very interesting, I think, what Ms. Walker said is actually a microcosm of the entire situation to me that they did not mention Colin Kaepernick's name at all. Um, you know, Roger Goodell did come out stating that they were wrong. 
Um, so if you're saying that you were wrong, the very first thing that should have been done was an apology to Colin Kaepernick um, because that was the, the entire situation. And, um, you know, honestly, it's going to fall on a lot of deaf ears unless he gets another opportunity to even get onto a roster and be able to do something. I think a lot of folks feel that way as it relates to, relates to that particular situation um, as far as the NFL. I will say this, that um, we have to realize that sports is just a microcosm of our society in general. Um, and, and it is something that I was shocked to hear them articulate the fact that without black men, that there would be no, um, no NFL. Football. Yeah, that, that was surprising to me. Um, we all know it's true. Yep. And it's, it's, a, it's a plain and simple fact that, you know, I believe it's the number is 70% of the NFL is black. Well, yeah, the top two, the top two sports in America are predominantly black: NFL and NBA. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, but the, the I think the NBA honestly can yeah they, a different animal at this point because of um, what happened. And I I like to be being a fan of the Miami Heat. I like to be able to say that my team was my team and my owner was one of those franchises that actually helped usher in a lot of that change uh, during that time, you know, being from South Florida and knowing how the climate is down there, it's, it's, Miami's an international city actually. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's about diversity. It's built on diversity. So it, it, it makes sense that it would happen, but, you know, I think the NFL needs to, the NFL needs to really step up. And the, the big issue is that of course, all of this is centered around the George Floyd situation and what's happening is regardless of all the rhetoric that's being put into place, regardless of all of the, the propaganda uh, that's being used, this is a very clear defining line. If you look at this and see anything other than a man being murdered by law enforcement, you are not, you, you, are, you are showing everybody exactly who you are. And I, I think that's the, that's the thing that's happened. And um, I mean, because, you know, I, I've, I've seen Caucasian people, I've seen Hispanic people who looked at this and they've just been like, look, there's just, there's no justification of this. You know, you can't justify that. And especially for a situation of a nonviolent offense, which is what- I mean, I've, Yeah, is I've seen law enforcement, yeah. say, you know, that have said, you know, per people that I've talked to personally, I mean, you know, you've seen the folks that have kind of come out more, more, um, you know, publicly and, and, and doing those sorts of um, actions and things like that. But I mean, I've talked to uh, law enforcement privately who have said, um, you know, it was just, it was wrong. And, and, um, and yeah, to your point, Roy, I mean, if, if you are having trouble saying it or, or, or acknowledging the, 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 just the, the horror, the horror that George Floyd experienced when he had that uh, police officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes and 48 seconds, and you can't say that that was wrong and it should not have happened, then you're, you're, you are part of the problem. And um, I don't know if I have people, my friends and followers that are watching it, but if you can't say it, then you should probably just stop following me. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's really cut and dry in this situation. I mean, this is, you know, this is one of those things that, that should miss us um, with the, like I said, with the rhetoric. And I mean, when you got people literally all over the world, yep. um, th this is no longer an American issue. And that's one of the things that it, it's making it um, a situation. I actually did a town hall meeting yesterday with a group of high school students because their principal uh, in, in putting out a message about these things, use the hashtag all lives matter. And see, right, and, and, but again, and I, 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 was told, I, I can understand, they're in I don't know all of the slangs and all the things that go along with what kids use and what terms they use. She wasn't doing it in a sense to diminish anything, but you know, the, the kids just really, they were hurting, they got offended and, and things of that nature. So we had to have that conversations with them. But you know, it's, yeah, you can't, you, you can't stand that. There's no middle ground on this one is, is what the issue is. There's, there's literally no middle ground. You either see right or you see wrong. And if you see right in that situation, 
that again, there's a problem that, that you're telling everybody who you are without any question. I mean, to see one of the things that shocked me was seeing the George Floyd pitcher challenge. Yeah. When I saw that at first, I'm like, oh, okay, this is just, you know, this is somebody who just put that out there. But then to see that it was actually a thing that people were doing. Okay. That, that says that, okay, you know what? You can't, you can't have any, I, I hate to say it this way, but you can't have any black friends. Right. If they're friends of yours after that. I mean, that, that's your human decency. That, that's, let, let's get past the uh, part of this that's, that is, that is race related. That is human decency. If you are literally making fun of someone being suffocated in that manner, um, you know, that, that shows the type of person that you are. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. And I mean, you know, I, I laugh at you. You're probably a little bit more gracious and understanding about that principle than I am because I mean, yeah, they might not have um, intended to do it, you know, or understood what hurt it might have caused, but it also indicates to me that they just not been paying attention. Right? Um, you know, you can't, you can't say all lives matter until black lives matter, period. And Full disclosure: the, the principal is a black woman, sure. to a black man who has. Yeah, black Candace stuff. Owens is a black woman. Yeah, no, nah, that's different. I'm. I'm <laughs> um, I, I mean, no, I, I, I just, you know, I, at this point, I, I, I hate to say that because I have tried to be. What's the word I want to use? Understanding, because I, I believe that just because of someone's views, we can't throw them away because of their views. Because we are not a monolithic people. We all have different views. We all have different opinions. And I get that. But again, this is one of those situations where it is a clear cut line. There is no, that is just what happened to George Floyd was wrong on every level, race, humanity, just human decency. That was just wrong. Yeah. And for her to, I haven't even listened to this one. I usually at least go listen to her comments to see what she's saying, because just like somebody's always, you know, they're always said, there's always at least a little truth in every lie. And so she is normally skirting that line so tightly, what she says. Um, but I, I don't even know. I, I don't even know yeah. if I could listen to the video for this I, because it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I listened to part of that this morning. Uh, I think it was like an 18-minute video. I finally cut it off about minute nine, minute 10, because I couldn't. I couldn't take it take it anymore because, in my opinion, you have to listen to the opposition and the other folk just to understand their frame of mind and where they're coming from. But then there comes a point from okay, I I understand how you interpret this. I may not agree with it, but I can understand your philosophy. To this crap makes absolutely no sense. What what does A have to do with B? And that's what a lot of the stuff that she brought up was from from the portion of it that I heard. Well, one thing had nothing to do with with the other. No matter what that man may have done in the past or anything like that, for a nonviolent passing passive funny money. Basically that's what it was. Twenty dollars. He died passive, for twenty dollars. Passive funny money did not deserve all of that. What happens when you do stuff like that? Hey, you may get a bench, you may be get a bench warrant ticket or something along those lines. Hey, we know you got it. Oh, bench warrant. Uh, we we see you in court. Uh, right now we see you on Zoom court because a lot of courts aren't open right now. And this and, and this thing sits out there for three years until it uh, comes up on the docket. That's how that's how it normally works on stuff this minor. He didn't he didn't have a gun. He didn't strong go and rob him. He didn't. But you understand, even if he did have a gun, even if he did have a gun, A.D., I mean, you know, we saw two, three weeks ago, fully armed people going up to capitals protesting about, you know, stay at home orders. And I don't recall any of them losing their lives for doing so. So uh, we, need, we need to listen to them and have a conversation. Whereas, right. whereas when somebody defending their own house where they thought they were getting robbed with a no-doc warrant, 
in the wrong house, shot back. He gets charged with attempted murder initially. Yeah. Thank God the people who who there came to their senses is like, no, this man did what any normal human being would have done. You shoot the gun at me and I have a gun at my disposal. You, you dog all right, I'm going to shoot back. I'm not just to say, hey, what you doing? Uh, hold up, no. That, I, I'm going, I'm, I'll fire first and ask some questions later in that situation. And he did what he, uh, what he thought was right. You know, Breonna Taylor would have turned 27 yesterday. It would have been her 27th birthday. And, um, you know, it's to, to Roy's point, you know, obviously a lot of this started off or, you know, a lot of this, this, the, the movement and the uprising and really sort of the national sort of um, an international sort of outcry that we're seeing right now started with George Floyd. You know, I think you also got to, you, you know, you can't forget about Ahmaud Arbery who had what, there was the, this week, I think, that the, the three men um, um, were, were uh, brought up uh, for arraignment, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, like I said, yesterday would, would have been Breonna Taylor's 27th birthday. Um, you know, you got to think about Christian Cooper. Remember, remember, so it's just, it's just kind of something. It was, it was that Monday when he was in, you know, Central Park doing the birding, when the, um, when the Amy Cooper lady called the police on him. And then Tuesday, it all came out, you know, the video came out with George Floyd. And I think what a lot of people, you know, kind of felt about that even was that what happened to George Floyd is what happens when people like Amy Cooper do things like she does, which is call the police and say, a black man is threatening me when none of that is happening, right? When nothing is going on. And so, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's certainly just, it's, it, it's it feels like it feels like a tipping point right now um, in America and, and and so much more than I think we've we've ever been at before you know um, you know like you said I um, I live in Ferguson um, that's where I'm calling y'all from right now um, my house is less than half a mile from Canfield Green apartments where Michael Brown was shot and killed and less than half a mile the other way to the Ferguson Police Department. And, you know, I represented this area in the state legislature for, for three years. Um, and I was the first um, state legislator uh, to represent the area that was elected after Mike Brown was, was, was shot and killed. Um, and over that time, in, in, those, in these past six years, um, since that has happened, there, there has been, I think, a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of change and a lot of progress that we've seen. Um, you know, we had a, an elected, um, pro, we had a prosecution, a prosecutor's um, election. And a Ferguson, a former Ferguson councilman, black man by the name of Wesley Bell, took out a 27 year incumbent named Bob McCullough, who was the one that refused to bring charges in the Darren Wilson situation. Or, well, let me, let me back up. He, he sent it to a grand jury. He didn't just charge himself. So yeah, he did refuse to bring charges because he could have just brought him. He didn't have to send it to a grand jury. But that's, but that's something that has happened, you know, in the past six years that, you know, a, a, a major proponent of criminal justice reform and, and someone from Ferguson who is now the top prosecutor for St. Louis County. Um, earlier this week, Tuesday, for the first time in history, in the history of Ferguson, there was a black mayor and a black woman by the name of Ella Jones that's been elected. And so, you know, I think we're starting to see all over, um, what the possibilities are. I mean, I gotta tell you, I feel so fortunate that the mayor of Atlanta is a black woman named Keisha. And a fam you alum. You know, uh, well, <laughs> fam you, all right, go Rattlers, I see y'all. Um, but, you know, you know, just being able to be a mother, you know, of, of, of black boys and really, you know, being able to understand and empathize with, with what's going on. Um, I saw that in, was it Tacoma, Washington? There's a similar situation where um, a, uh, I think it's a 33-year-old black man uh, died in police custody 
uh, from the, in the same sort of fashion that that um, George Floyd was killed. And Tacoma, Washington has a black woman mayor who is like, I'm a black woman first and foremost. You know, I'm the mayor, but I'm also a black woman. And so, you know, I think we are seeing, oh God, Muriel Bowser, the DC mayor, did y'all of who who made one of the most, I think profound statements and you know there are a lot of people that are that are that are that I've seen that have that have been critical of her but you know she she has put it up in no uncertain terms and it's so I mean and, and the fact that we're doing this when the current occupant that you have in the White House is in the White House doing things like calling in the military in order to go and take a picture in order for you know for a photo op and so you know i think that we are seeing a real sort of just a, a a change in the tide really in terms of people's um willingness to speak out and, and doing so so unapologetically and so openly and also people that are willing to that are that are doing what needs to be done in order to make the sort of system, systems and systemic level change that you need to have by getting, you know, people in office that that look like us and that have experienced the similar sorts of things, so that when the policies are being made, they're being made from a not just an informed perspective, perspective, but a real personal perspective too, which I think is really important when it comes to policy making. And so. Um, and so, you know, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll really see. Um, you know, I, I was watching, I turn my Amazon fire stick on and it's right there. Amazon bl believes that black lives matters. And so, you know, I, I think that the sort of, the sort of um, awareness that is, has been generated from this instance um, and really the change would not have happened had it not been for, you know, Ferguson six years ago and Mike Brown um, uh, being killed six years ago. And so, um, you know, it's really something. I mean, the thing though that, that we have to be vigilant about is that it can't just stop at statements, right? It can't just stop at, um, you know, Nike putting out a commercial. What is Nike doing in its own house and its own, you know, you know, the four walls of its corporation to actually make that statement that they put out a reality, right? What are they doing to make sure that black and brown voices that are, um, you know, employees of theirs are heard, are valued, um, are in leadership positions, you know? And so, and so, yeah, thank you. Thank everybody. I'm so glad everybody is, is, is getting, is waking up. Welcome. Um, but but now but now let's let's actually get to work. And with that being said, uh, we're we're gonna take a short break. Uh, Got to pay some bills. Uh, when we come back from this break, we're gonna talk about a how Ferguson actually recovered from 2014 until until now, and some of the advice that you can give for the state of uh, for Minneapolis and some of the other cities who are going through these uh, issues. And we're going to talk about your time in the Missouri legislature. So we'll be back right here on the Jericho Broadcast Network. Uh, a gentleman wanted to do the Black College Sports Network in partnership with the HBCUs. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, 
and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay. Call Cuvay. I have in me the ability to make you a better you. So if you work hard, focus, stay on point, you can do anything. Trust me. We made this track to tell everybody they can follow their dreams. The Creole seasoning is a sodium-free and sugar-free blend that's versatile enough to put on anything. One of the first blends I developed more than eight years ago, the Creole seasoning has an unmistakable aroma, a bold flavor, and a little heat for character. Every time I open one of these bottles, I hear trumpets and big band music. People that don't get to see me Trying to remind you who you are just like in Romans 3 See we about to blow across the world just like a day that's breezy This motivation for the people and this classic Bible teaching say Make this for my people that don't get to see me Trying to remind you who you are just like in Romans 3 See we about to blow across the world just like a day that's breezy This motivation for the people and this classic Bible teaching Hey, 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 hey Motivation We're back here at Jericho Broadcast Network, Urban World News, and our special guest for this conversation is former Missouri State Representative Cora Faith Walker, currently works for the St. Louis County Executive, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Last week, my partner Roy down there had the opportunity to talk to current Minnesota State Representative Hadan Hassan, who represents the area where the Michael Floyd incident happened. You being a former state legislator in Missouri, what advice would you offer her and kind of talk about that path of recovery that Ferguson had from, we all saw what happened in 2014 and the, you know, the, the rioting and everything to where it is now and where, where, where Ferguson is going in the future? Sure, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and yeah, like you said, I um, I was in the, or was a Missouri State Representative, and I actually represented the area um, that Mike Brown was was uh, shot and killed in. Um, Canfield Green uh, Apartments um, was in my district, and you know, um, just by way of background, um, I am um, a healthcare attorney by training, and I've got a master's in public health, and um, you know, when I when I ran uh, for office, I, I talked a lot about about um, public health, really, and taking a public health approach to public safety and criminal justice. Um, you know, there's so many things that we criminalize that are basic health related issues, um, like substance use, for example. Um, you know, drug use. Um, you know, one of the one of the very first pieces of uh, legislation that I it was, it was actually the first piece of legislation that I filed, um, and I actually got passed was about making sure that treatment courts were available to to all kinds of people, to to veterans, to um, to to people who are just um, you know who who might be in justice involved and and, and those sorts of things, and so um, and so you know one of the big things that I talked about when I ran and and, and the work that I worked on when I was um, when I was in office was about trauma that we experience as a community right and the PTSD that really we have as an entire, you know, community, black community, um, and the sorts of ways that that manifests in, in our ability to maintain, you know, to, to let me, let's, let me just start from the beginning, to get, to, to get educated, right? Um, to, to maintain a job, um, to, to maintain a family and, and keep a family, you know, if, if I'm, worried about or triggered by the fact that, you know, I might get stopped by the police on the way from work um, every day. I, I might be, you know, less inclined <laughs> to go to work. Um, and so, and so, you know, the whole idea behind the public health approach is, is really 
based in prevention and then and then treatment right it, it's, it's like a, it's a harm reduction model and it's that same that same sort of approach can be applied to public safety you know um there's a lot of there's a lot of um talk right now about um a really really interesting sort of set of proposals that came out of ferguson um and the ferguson commission that was um put together and then some other groups like um like um um oh gosh uh, like with Brittany Packnett and D. Ray um, McKisson um, about around eight can't wait, right? There are eight policies that they are proposing that leaders take um, in order to reduce police violence and law enforcement um, related violence. And it's, it's a, I think it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good start. It really is a good start, but I also want to prevent the violence from happening in the first place, right? And so whether or not that is sending a social worker on a domestic violence call instead of an armed police officer, whether or not it's having community health workers that are going out and, and working with um, our unhoused population and community instead of an armed uniformed police officer. Um, you know, if it's getting all officers crisis intervention training so that when they encounter um, people who are who are dealing with crises and going through crises the they they know how to de-escalate the situation as opposed to going the opposite way um, you know these these are real sorts of, of, of solutions that that can make a difference um, you know and and quite frankly and, and to your question about you know the advice that that um, I would give to um, to the representative in in Minnesota. Um, you know, I was able to get a lot of this that sort of that sort of legislation done in Missouri, and I got to tell you, Missouri is 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 a little different than Minnesota. Um, um, I think Minnesota has a has a Democrat governor, if I'm not mistaken. Missouri certainly does not. Um, Missouri's governor is actually a former sheriff, um, who also, interestingly enough, um, has said that publicly, you know, what happened to George Floyd um, um, was was wrong. But, you know, I think what I would say is that we've got a real window of opportunity right now to make real bold change. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the approaches that that I that I kind of went with were um, were incremental, right? They, they, they were small, they were meaningful. Don't get me wrong, they weren't they, they were very meaningful. Um, but they were also very they were they were also very incremental. Um, and so what I would say is, you know, tr to really, really push for for bold and transformative change, because we are in um, a moment that is that is that is tragic, but it's also, you know, out of tragedy can come, you know, comes opportunity to make, to make, to make some change. And so I would encourage her, um, the representative to, to be bold. Um, and to your second point about Ferguson and just some of the progress that Ferguson has seen, you know, um, and, and some of the changes that have, that have come out of it, you know, like I said, uh, one of the biggest things that I can point to is the election of um, of the new, uh, well, I guess he's not new now. It's been about a year or so. But um, the current uh, county prosecutor, Wesley Bell, who was a former um, Ferguson councilman, um, you know, who took out a two uh, what a twenty seven year incumbent. Um, you know, we've seen now the first black mayor of Ferguson get elected earlier this week, um, and so. And so, you know, I think that we're, we're certainly seeing, um, certainly seeing progress, but we, we still do have a, a, a long way to go to, um, and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of healing to do um, still a, as a community. But the thing about the healing is that, you know, you, you can't just put a Band-Aid on it, right? Like what we're talking about and what we're, and what we're dealing with, um, you know, there, there, there are scars deep scars that that um that exist from 
400 years, let's be very honest, it's based on, um, you know, a society is based on 400 years of, of racism. And, you know, it's not going to be solved overnight or in six years. And, and quite honestly, I don't know if it's going to be solved in my lifetime. But that's even more reason why the message that I have to the sister in, in Minnesota, I think is so important, which is, you know, is, is to be as bold and as, as unapologetic as possible, because we got to deal with dismantling 400 years of a system that, you know, said that black people were not equal. All right, Roy, you're up. So in the conversations um, that I had with Representative Hassan, I, you, I was telling her, you know, that I think one of the things that we have to do is exactly uh, what Ms. Walker is saying is that we have to be in a transformative state of mind where we are today. We cannot continue to just sit back and expect that things are going to happen. Um, now, to that point, I think we, you know, one of the things that we as a network are focusing on and that we want to do is that we have to stop asking other people what they're going to do for us. Um, and we have to start dictating the things that we want to see happen and the things that we want to see moving forward. Um, you know, we have to look at our political strength and actually utilize it because that's one of the challenges that we have is that we have not had a quote unquote agenda. Uh, we have not had actionable items that we have gone to people and say, let's do some things and let's see some legislation put into place um, and given some of that. Now, I did a, a actually a live uh, last Monday uh, where I started off the process. We actually have a 12-point plan that I developed with a think tank of people about four years ago um, that are issues and things that can be done across the country in literally every black community we're going to have pretty much similar situations of course every community is going to have some individual things that are unique to them and that may be slightly different but for the most part we are dealing with the same issues across this country and so we've got a the, the phase one of our plan was that 12 point plan of things that we can do and and so there are three phases to the plan phase one is again what we as a community have to do these are the things that we execute, that we make happen, that we put into place in our community. Phase two includes or is focused around our HBCUs as well as our civic and social organizations um, across the board. Again, though, these are the things that we do in the first part of the process. Now, phase three does actually get into legislation. It gets into adjusting laws and making things that can be transformative and beneficial across the board that we can deal with some of the quick processes. Uh, these are things that won't take the legislative process because again, that's one of the things that people have to realize, you know, one of the big arguments, and I actually asked this question on social media uh, about a day and a half ago, why do people think that black people have yet to get reparations? And it's interesting to see the different comments that people have, but one of the things that it also says is that people don't really know the entire process behind all of those things. And so my thing is, as long as they keep holding that reparations conversation out, we're going to be shooting for the, you know, we're, we're taking the three-pointer to win the game when we've got enough time to take two, you know, three two-point shots instead of trying to get the big, you know, the big home run and everything. And so that, that's what we have to do. Um, just as an example, one of the things that we're going to, when I release phases two and three of our plan, uh, again, the third one being about legislation that we need, one of the things that we're, gonna, that we're gonna say that we want done is that the president can sign an executive order that will designate every HBCU campus in this country as an enterprise zone. So now what you're doing is you're allowing businesses and people to come in to partner with these universities to infuse the cash that they need into their systems to do some different things. We're also going to call for a base, and this is sort of a base reparations type situation, but a fund that's set up so that we can create endowments at all of, again, at all of these HBCUs so that they can use and operate off those funds that come into through those endowments and, and things of that nature. 
So there, there are different things in communities. And, and you know, we have, again, the, the, the beauty of what we're going to be proposing. Excuse me. These are not just ideas. We've actually sat down and fleshed out how all of these things function. So we've, we've got systematic plans that can be put in place with checks and balances to make sure that the funds go to the right place, to make sure that these things that are designated and, and assigned for student usage and student populations get to where they're supposed to go. And, you know, yearly oversight so that you don't have the opportunity for people to do illegal things that they shouldn't be doing. But again, we, we've got to stop letting people de determine and dictate who and what we want from them and who and what we're going to get. So in, until we do these things on a, on a larger scale, um, we're going to continue to have these problems. And, you know, this is one of the things, because of course there is the, 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 there's two sides to every coin, as they say. And there are those out there who are not fans of the Black Lives Matter movement. So let me, because, and this is something I think we, we need to understand. There is a difference between the actual structure of the movement and then the spirit of the movement because the spirit of the movement is what we all talk about. It is that black lives matter and they should matter just as much as everybody else. And right now that's what we're talking about because those are the lives that we are seeing on social media being destroyed and destructed. We are seeing people die at the hands of people who are supposed to be protecting them. So the spirit of it works and is, is definitely what we should have. But again, there are people who don't believe, and, and as someone who's been in politics for 20 plus years, um, you know, I've been a, a media consultant, a political media consultant for years. I, I think back to the 2016 election, and unfortunately, this is, this is one of those things that I think we miss a lot of when we have our opportunities to really be impactful, that we use them and we're trying to use them for sound bites. And honestly, I want to say that they were in, in Missouri when this happened, when Hillary Clinton was talking to the members of Black Lives Matter, and she specifically asked them, what do you want? They spent three minutes telling her, say our name. No, she's asking you, you're talking to a presumptive presidential candidate. They are asking you, what type of things do you want to see happen in your community? And you're sitting here asking her to say your name. See, this, this is the part where we have to be more smart about what we're doing in our processes. You know, because, and, and as a, someone who's in politics, I've, I'm one of those people who said, hey, listen, if Donald Trump was to ever call me and ask me to come to the White House to talk about anything, I'm going. Because I can't hold someone accountable for something that I can't tell them or that we didn't ask for. So you can say whatever you want to, but if all of our leaders who have our best interest at heart, who people don't consider to be quote unquote coons, you know, if those people don't talk to leadership, you can't say anything about what that leadership does. Martin Luther King went and talked to who again? Who, who did he sit down with? Someone who was a, a, a pretty much known racist or at least felt that he was, you know, very conservative. That's what we have to do. And we have to have these uncomfortable conversations. And sometimes you have to have them in uncomfortable spaces. Um, but that is the only way to get your message out and to make sure that, you're, that you are being represented in every space. And so I also believe that we need to have people on each side. But the reality of it is that those people have to have the best interest of Black America at heart when they sit down. Uh, so to quantify what I'm saying, I guess that's, that's where, like I said, with the last statements apparently that Miss Miss Owens made, that I think she has definitely fallen off of that bus. If she had, if she was still hanging on to the back door, she let go with the set of statements that she had at that point. Um, you know, but those, that's what we've got to do. We we've got to be forthright. We've got to be forthcoming. We've got to be aggressive in what we are asking for. And uh, like I said, as a network, we plan on being in the forefront at the front page of that from here on out so yeah yeah you know i i i will say i um you know i've i've got i've gotten a, a real sort of opportunity um and and privilege really to to get a chance to know um some of the folks that are a part of uh the, the movement for black lives um um 
that you know were kind of founding founding members of it and um and campaign zero that's what i was that's what i was thinking of earlier with the whole um with the eight can't wait which are the uh, eight uh police reform proposals that um that were uh that were i think released in 2016 originally but um the point is that you know i think that there has been um a lot of growth and a lot of learning that's come from from that movement for Black Lives and even um, the the campaign Zero folks now to know that you know um, I, I heard Brittany Patnett who I uh, actually went to um, undergrad with and have known for for many many years um, say the other day when she was hosting the um, town hall with uh, President Obama um, you know that that it's not it it, it shouldn't be considered protest or policy change you get you know you get, you get the window to create policy change from protests right but it's like once you've captured the attention of people once you've disrupted once you you know um grown you know and 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 and, and built a movement um then what do you do? What sort of policy changes do you want to see happen? And, you know, I, I think that the movement for Black Lives certainly has some, and, and then the, this Campaign Zero group certainly has some as well. But, you know, one thing I will say too, um, so as AD was saying, um, I am now the director of policy for uh, the St. Louis County Executive, which is basically like the mayor of St. Louis County. Um, and St. Louis County is the largest county in the state of Missouri and is actually the 43rd largest county in the country. And um, the county executive and I, um, um, you know, have, have, a, have a really, really good, really good and positive working relationship. And, um, you know, he, he called me last week, um, last Saturday, I think it was, um, and just asked me, um, you know, just point blank, what, what should he be doing? He was like, what, what should I be doing? And, you know, as a director of policy and, and as someone, you know, I mean, I'm a policy one, you know, really at the end of the day, but one of the things that I did, um, and said to him was that, um, I was just going to speak to him as a black woman who was married to a black man who one day hopefully will have, you know, black kids, you know, black sons and, and, and black daughters. And quite frankly, it was up to him to decide how to use the power and the privilege that he has as a white man in the position that he's in to do something meaningful. Um, because, because quite frankly, I gotta say, I'm tired. <laughs> I am tired. Listen, I appreciate, I appreciate my, you know, the, the allies in, in this work and in this movement. You know, I'm so, so happy to see su such a diverse group um, of folks that are like actually getting out and, and, and protesting and, and getting, you know, getting into the streets. Um, you know, the, the chairwoman of the county council um, is, is, a, is a white woman and she um, came with me last week to protest. Um, at the county seat, um, you know, and she had her sign that, you know, said she's a white mom for black lives and all that. So that's great. Um, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, God, what is, what is, what is, I can't remember what the quote is, but, you know, and, and, and it's also just, you know, it, it is, it is tiring and exhausting to be expected to also have to tell people <laughs> what it is they should be doing as well you know what i mean it's like well look you know <laughs> something different right like you, you need to do something different but um you know um in, in all in all seriousness um you know it it does come down to i think us taking control and responsibility ourselves as a community, right? Um, you know, it's if not now, if not us who, if not now, when? And, um, and, you know, I think that we've really 
we've captured, we've captured the world, right? Like what's happened to George Floyd has captured the attention of the world. And we really, as a community, have an opportunity to, to say, these are the things that we want to see happen in order to change the, the, the system so that we don't have a George Floyd or a Breonna Taylor or an Ahmaud Aubrey or a Michael Brown or a Sandra Bloyd or a Trayvon Martin. And I could just obviously keep going on and on and on. Um, but it's, I think it's important to, to ground ourselves in the fact that these are people at the end of the day. Um, they're more than just hashtags. They're more than just names. These are people. And, um, and you know, I think that's really why it, it is important, um, you know, for folks to acknowledge, you know, and actually say their names. But then, you know, we get, we get, we get to work and, and get to work to, to dismantling the systems of oppression that have been, you know, have become just ingrained in our institutions and in our society um, over the past 400 years. All right, cool. Well, since, you, since you're screaming that you're tired, I guess it's time, that would be a good time for us to take a break and let you get some water and refresh yourself so we can come back with our final segment here uh, uh, on the, uh, Urban, Urban World News, you're, you're tuning in to Jericho Broadcast Network. You know, the real reason why I went after uh, Comcast and Charter, it didn't, even have, it didn't have anything to do with my cable networks. It didn't. What happened was uh, a gentleman wanted to do the Black College Sports Network in partnership with the HBCUs mm -hmm. and Comcast did not accept it and that would have made a lot of money for these black colleges Absolutely. and it would have educated the black college sports network this is what he wanted to do that would have educated a lot of black kids and when they didn't do that that's when I came off the bench and said okay I'm gonna light you up like a Christmas tree mm -hmm. okay that was the real reason why I got into it was when I saw what happened with the Black College Sports Network, which I don't know. I just knew that these black, <laughs> like that, all right? I knew that these black colleges were going to benefit, and these black kids were going to get the education that they deserved and not have to pay. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Full, but we Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. So we've got a Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock in downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992 or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, authentic Caribbean cuisine. is a premium health and wellness tea line focused on bringing delicious yet healthy tea blends to the community. Filled with an abundance of vitamins and antioxidants, we work to blend teas with exotic spices and fruits to produce scrumptious and wholesome beverages. So check us out at MyMajestees.com. That's M-Y-M-A-J-E-S-T-E-A-S.com. My Majesties. 
an Urban Passport member. He was hurting, but I didn't bandage the rope. Now I got too sick with it. Now we done found us on a pro sound. Look, I be tearing the speakers up and we shaking the whole ground. You found pros in this profession. We calling that profound. Studio in every city. I'm calling that yo town. Some of these words that I'm using make me want to throw down. But I got humbled in my veins and learned to tone it down. Major league when I'm pitching. I'm needing the pitches, man. Check the room with my powers and knocking the pitches down. Trying to teach you business first and put your pitches down. Major. We're back with another conversation here on the Jericho Broadcast Network. Joining us along with my CEO and partner, Roy Evans, is former Missouri Representative Cora Faith Walker, current Policy Director for St. Louis County, Cora Faith Walker. And Cora, you, you spent three years in the legislature. You left the legislature after three years, despite the resounding numbers that you had and support you had within your district won your first primary, uh, you garnered over 83% of the votes in your, in your first primary. No Republican, uh, no Republican was crazy enough to run against you. Second time you ran unopposed. So you had success uh, being elected. Your people loved you in the legislature, but you left the legislature to go work for, you know, St. Louis County. Uh, obviously, we know as much as national elections uh, matter and state elections matter, things really get done on the local level. Did this have something to do with your decision to leave state legislation and go back to the local level? Uh, you know, what were some of those factors in that? Uh, yeah, election? yeah, no, that's 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 a really really good point. And so yeah, um, there there were some um, circumstances that um, had occurred where the former um, county executive got um, indicted by the federal government, the FBI, and is uh, currently in, in jail. Um, and so there's a new um, county executive, uh, Dr. Sam Page, that, um, that uh, was, was selected to, um, to take over in the position of, of the county executive. And um, yeah, to, to, to your point, um, you know, d despite my time in the legislature, um, in the state legislature, and uh, really despite um, you know, passing some real um, significant legislation and um, and 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 you know, getting some significant funding for a lot of um, I think really important initiatives secured in the state budget. Um, you know, I realized that the local level is really um, is really really important and where where the rubber really meets the road for for a lot of work. And you know, I also realized that I had an opportunity to help direct policy for, um, you know, the, ne the nearly 1 million people that, that live in St. Louis County. Um, as a state representative, my district uh, um, uh, had a population of 37,500 people. Um, but now as a director of policy, um, you know, I'm able to, 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 to do the sort of work and, and implement the sort of change um, that that has has a broader reach and a broader uh, uh, broader um, opportunity uh, to to really affect and improve people's lives, and you know, um, it's been it's been something. It's not even been a year yet, and um, there have been kind of two two big things that have that have happened um, in the past. But you had one big one this week three months um, that that really, um, I think, emphasized to me the importance of, of local government. Um, and the first is the coronavirus. Um, so, you know, we, we, that's something else we hadn't really talked about. You know, we, we've, got, we've got two pandemics going on right now, right? The pandemic of racism and, and then the, and the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And, um, you know, the first case of, uh, of COVID-19 that was um, at least announced or originally was in St. Louis County. And so um, in Missouri um, was in St. Louis County and St. Louis County has really been kind of the epicenter for, um, for the number of cases. Just like I said, you know, St. Louis County is the largest county 
in the state of Missouri uh, with nearly a million people. Um, but also it was really sort of interesting um, because of my background in public health, um, you know, the county executive uh, placed me at the um, emergency operating center. And so I, I actually uh, became an, an, it was an incident commander for our emergency response to COVID-19 and, um, and, you know, really saw how our local public health department was really key and crucial to to, um, to to mitigating to mitigating and fighting against the spread of COVID nineteen, um, and then obviously the other thing is you know what is what got us here is is what happened uh, with George Floyd, um, and and the movement that's really um, been re reignited about uh, police reform. That happens a lot of that happens on the local level. Um, you know we've got a board of police commissioners. Um, one of the things that we did um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty early on in, in the county executive's um, tenure um, and was prompted by, by a lawsuit, a discrimination lawsuit um, that was filed by a police officer um, who, who happened to be gay, um, was, was changed the entire uh, board of police commission. We put, um, there are more women or um, there are less men on the board than, um, than other people on the board. Um, there are two black people that are on the board of police commission. And the police commission um, makes and sets the policies that our local police department um, follows. That's at the state level, that's really not at the federal level, that's at the local level. And so, um, you know, I, I think that people tend to forget sometimes that, you know, your local school board election, you know, your local, um, you know, council person election, your local um, mayor's election, that is what affects your day-to-day -day life um, more than, than anything that really happens at the state level or the federal level for that matter. Not saying that those aren't important because those are just important, just as important. Um, but you know, people people tend to um, tend to to forget about the importance of of uh, local government as well. And so, um, so you know, I I really do feel that like every you know that everything happens for a reason. You know, um, Esther four, fourteen is one of my one of my favorite Bible verses. And you know, I, I do feel like uh, this is this perhaps this is the moment for which I was created. Um, but I, I am, um, I'm really, I'm really, I feel, you know, I don't feel any sort of regrets for, for making the decision to, to come um, to the local level um, because we're, we're really, we're faced with a lot of crises and challenges right now. And, and, and this is, this level is where things get done um, to, endure, to really address those crises. Now you say you got almost a billion people up under your uh, watch. How many local, uh, how many local municipalities are within St. Louis County? So people who are not familiar yes. with St. Louis County, and for those who do not know, there is a line between St. Louis City and St. Louis County, and the city of St. Louis is not within the jurisdiction of St. Louis County. You have you have to be from that area to understand that. So. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, but thank you for bringing that up. That's a really good point. So, yeah. So, St. Louis County is a county of, of nearly a million people, um, but we have 88 different municipalities that are located within St. Louis County. Um, so, Ferguson is an example of one of those municipalities. Um, in addition to that, we also have 55 separate police departments that. Um, go up under, um, you know, that, that might be associated with one or other of those um, of those uh, 88 different municipalities. So Ferguson, again, for example, um, has its own police department, and then St. Louis County has its uh, has a department as well. Um, there are about 300,000 people that live in unincorporated St. Louis County, so um, that aren't necessarily within uh, any sort of um, one of those 88 different municipalities. And like you said, um, St. Louis City is a completely separate entity and completely separate um, government that has about 300,000 people or so. And that's in St. Louis City, which is yeah, just across 
you know, a specific boundary. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of a um, government sort of structure too. Um, I'll say that that certainly does um, present a lot of challenges. Um, um, but um, yeah, it's at, at the, at when, you know, it's, it is, it is the largest county in the state of Missouri. 16% uh, of all people in Missouri live in St. Louis County. Um, and it is the 43rd largest county in the entire, in the entire country. So it's a do, place. Then when you throw in St. St. Charles County and yeah. the Metro East area, that's what makes up what people call metropolitan St. Louis, Missouri. Correct. And I got to tell you, trying to coordinate a response to COVID-19 across all those different jurisdictions uh, and states too, right? So you got you got different counties within Missouri, but then, you know, we're right here at, you know, the Illinois line. And so you got, you know, the, you got the Metro East, you got St. Clair County. And so it's, yeah, the, the Metro area um, is, is large and it crosses several jurisdictions. And, uh, and yeah, that, that's, a, that's been, it's been quite a, Quite, quite an experience. Also. Did you have one you wanted to get in, Roy? I see you smiling over there. No, just listening to the dynamic of that whole area that you guys are, um, that you guys are from, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, St. Louis is, is, is a very, very, very unique place. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that, um, that what you all have done is, is something that we need to look at. Like I said, we, we've got a, a plan, and I was, I was on another show earlier this week, um, and one of the statements that I made and I told people, I said, the reality that a lot of people don't know is that politics is actually the only place where the trickle up theory works because it starts at the local level. Yeah. And the reality is, is if you get enough local municipalities doing something, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. The state is going to have to make it happen. Yeah. Once you get enough states making something happen, yeah. guess what happens? The federal government has to start making those things happen. So this is one of the things that we have to do in getting people more engaged in their local politics and in the local situations that they're dealing with. I mean, especially, and, and it's, it's interesting because the two primary places are your policing, your education. You know, we can, if you start changing those on the local level, it is going to impact the national scene within two years totally. It wouldn't, it would not take that long because again, once you get enough local municipalities doing something, the states are going to have to take notice, and and they're going to have to start pushing those same those same type of agendas because, needless to say, the 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 the, lo the locals have already shown that that's what they want. So that that's what we're going to be looking at part of, and we Miss Miss Walker, we're going to definitely have to be reaching out to you to see um see how we can get you engaged in our think tank because we're going to start doing a lot of the things like a lot of these big lobby firms do. We're going to start writing the legislation and handing it to these representatives and saying, hey, this is what we need you to do. Um, a lot of people exactly how it goes for a lot of people. So yeah, most people have no clue on how this works. And you know, they, they think that these people are actually sitting up in a room <laughs> writing this stuff. And it's just like, no, they're not. So somebody else is writing this for them and saying, this is what we want you to do. This is what we want. I wrote all my bills, I will say, but, but yeah. Sign right here. <laughs> sign right here. <laughs> But yes, that does happen quite often. So, you know, yes, please sign me up. I'll, I'll be, I am more than, more than happy to help. Um, just, just let me know. AD knows, right. knows how to get in touch with me. All right, we're going to start winding this down, but I got, got a couple more things I wanted to bring out with, uh, for you, Cora. Uh, born in St. Louis, raised in Tuskegee, Alabama, went back to St. Louis. Now, before we, I want to hit on two things. Talk, talk about that transition and then if you want to hit on it, talk about that article that I sent you yesterday about that uh, 1950 stuff that happened in Tuskegee, Alabama, over the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, I'm glad that you uh, brought that up. So yeah, I, um, I grew up in in Macon County, Alabama, um, in Tuskegee. Um, you know, the the site of in the home of the Airmen and the syphilis study. Um, you know, Tuskegee certainly has has um, a, a very very rich history um, in in America, and um, you know one of the things that I that I noticed and kind of would you know comment on a whole lot um, is that when so I, I played sports um, uh, growing up uh, in Alabama and um, 
I, I went to, to private school and, um, you know, the, the history kind of of the athletic associations and private schools in Alabama um, were that a lot of them were created as a result to integration. You see right there behind me, I got my uh, picture of Ruby Bridges um, the, my, from the Norman Rockwell painting. And so um, a lot of, a lot of the um, schools, um, the private schools in Alabama were created as a um, response to um, integration and, um, you know, people not wanting uh, their kids to go to school with, with black kids. And so, um, you know, playing sports, I traveled, you know, to all kinds of different places in, in Alabama. And then I came to St. Louis for college. And one of the things that really just struck me and stuck out to me was the sort of baked in institutionalized sort of racism that exists in St. Louis. Um, you know, St. Louis is a place where it's, it's, there's a street called Del Mar. And depending on what side of the street <laughs> Del Mar you live on, um, you know, it, you, you could be, be living in a million dollar home with a certain life expectancy, or if you go north of it, which is really the black area, um, you know, it, it's completely different. Um, you know, there, there's been a really interesting study that's been done by a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Jason Purnell, called For the Sake of All, that found that um, the life expectancy for a person in St. Louis changes, is decreased by 18 years if you are living in a zip code on one side of Del Mar versus the other side of Del Mar. So you understand that just based on the zip code where you live in St. Louis, your life expectancy can be lower by 18 years. And that's just, I mean, that's, that's some, um, that is, that is, that is the heart of the problem that we're talking about. And so, um, and so, you know, St. Louis is, like I said, is, is a very, very unique place. And I've, you know, heard someone say that it's also been incredibly innovative um, in the ways in which it does, like man, uh, racism manifests um, versus like Alabama, and to, to your point, A.D., um, who, who's very much so in your face about, about the racism. And so, you know, um, um, you shared with me that last night there was just a, a you know, a old fashioned old -fashioned, cross -burn. good old fashioned <laughs> cross burning um, that, that happened where, you know, it's just, it's kind of that sort of blatant um, in your face sort of um, racism. Now that said, you know, St. Louis, St. Louis does have have a lot of that as well. Um, but it's it's also just so 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 baked into and ingrained in in um, in just the the institutions um, that that exist in in St. Louis uh, that it, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of commitment to to try to address and um, and and to dismantle. But, um, you know, um, I also, I also recognize, I mean, there are a lot of people that are committed to doing just that. Here he, they, they asked him what is, uh, what the biggest challenge was, um, that faced St. Louis County and he said racial equity. Um, and this is, you know, last year that he said this before a lot of this stuff, um, I'm really popped off. And so, um, so you've got folks that are committed to, to, um, to, to seeing, to seeing things change. Um, talk about some of your, your work and your legislation that you did, uh, with veterans, uh, your dad, mom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, like I said, uh, the, one of the first bills that I ever, uh, is the first bill I ever filed. And, um, the first one I ever got passed was to, um, expand access to treatment courts um, for, for uh, veterans courts, family courts, mental health courts. Um, and that was something that I was really, really proud of. It actually, um, St. Louis County, um, as a result of it, was able to get a pretty significant um, federal, federal uh, grant in order to expand uh, treatment courts because of that legislation that I was able to pass. Um, I also um, have done a lot of work around um, um, 
infant and maternal health. I, you know, care a whole lot about black mamas and black babies, especially. Um, and um, as someone, I'm, you know, trying to have a baby with my husband right now and everything. And I also um, passed this, uh, actually bipartisan uh, legislation, uh, but it was something that I uh, filed along with um, another Democrat and then two other Republicans. It was its first in the country uh, legislation to um, allow for um, Medicaid access for, um, for pregnant women with substance use disorder. And just kind of to speak to the thing that I was talking about earlier in terms of a lot of things that um, are really health related issues that have become criminalized I think it was really something like the same, like in the same session in which, you know, I was working on getting that legislation passed and that bill passed, there was a Republican representative, uh, one of my former colleagues, who was trying to um, <laughs> take away parental rights and throw women in jail if they had babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. So not actually address the issue of the substance use, he was going to take away their children and throw them in jail. And so, you know, it's kind of, it, I, I think it just kind of goes to, and that's an example of what I was talking about when I'm talking about kind of public health versus, um, you know, criminal justice and criminalizing health issues. And so that was something else that I did. And then, you know, the other thing that I really, I just am very, very, very proud of um, is that I, I, you know, secured funding uh, for community health workers to be, uh, um, to, to be at um, our community health centers throughout the entire state of Missouri. Um, community health workers are people that, that are from the community um, that, you know, might have better relationships with, um, with folks in the community than doctors do, for that matter. You know, um, I think, if, you know, being from Tuskegee, there, there is a real reason why the Black community doesn't necessarily and always trust, um, you know, uh, doctors and trust uh, healthcare, right? Um, because it's because called of, syphilis study. Because of the syphilis study, and so the whole idea behind community health workers is to get people from the community um, working on all kinds of different health-related issues that might not just be, you know, going to the doctor, but also might be making sure that, um, you know, that that you. I mean, there, there are all kinds of social determinants of health, right? You know, that that you have uh actual working smoke detector or that you know how to you know get your diabetes medication and where to go get it and so um secure funding for um for community health workers throughout the state of missouri as well um since i've been the director of policy there's also been some some things that we've been able to do that um that we um quite frankly couldn't get done in the state legislature so um in in missouri still in, in, in prisons um, and in jails, uh, pregnant women that are in jails can be shackled when they're giving birth. So put into chains as they're giving birth, yes, as they're giving birth in jail, shackled. And we could not get the legislation passed. It's not like you're going anywhere while you, while you try to push a baby out. I mean, and it's, and it's just incredibly dehumanizing. It really is. And, and, but we couldn't, but we could not, we could not get the legislation passed um, through, you know, to ban shackling of pregnant women um, uh, in the state legislature. So one of the very first things that I did uh, when I joined uh, the, the director, uh, you know, the, the county um, executive's administration, Dr. Page's administration, uh, was um, draft an executive order banning uh, shackling in, in, um, St. Louis County. in St. Louis County jails. Um, and so there, there are a lot of things that, um, that we've been working on and getting done um, on the local level. Uh, just earlier this week, and I am very proud of it, and we're going to probably be talking a lot more about it, um, the county council passed a resolution that explicitly and unequivocally stated that racism is a public health crisis. And that is something that is so important, I think, because, you know, it actually says it, right? Like you can't start to address an issue until you actually acknowledge and identify the issue. And so um, with everything that's been going on with COVID, you know, that, that was something that we, we had been talking about doing anyway, but then that combined with, you know, just a lot of the, the, um, the, uh, the protests and, and the movement that's going on right now, you know, uh, the, the council members thought it was important 
to, um, to, to you know, explicitly state that racism is a public health crisis. And so, um, yeah, those are just some of the examples of some policies that we're working on. Um, we're taking a little look now, or we're taking a look now at um, some of the uh, issues around, uh, around, you know, just the complications around COVID-19 and the fact that you've got, you know, so many folks that are out um, protesting right now and just kind of what, what that might mean specifically for uh, for black and brown communities in the area. And so, um, so yeah, there, there's still a lot of work that we've got going on. All right. Uh, we're going to have to get you out of here. We only got a couple minutes left on this. Uh, any, 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 any final thoughts uh, that you want to put out before I, before I do my uh, wrap up and let Roy do his uh, wrap up? Well, you know, I just want to, I just want to um, thank you again for inviting me. Um, brother i really <laughs> we, i i have I've, I've failed to mention that um you are uh my big brother and so um i really do appreciate uh you you having me on here and really just all the support that you've uh, given me and the advice you've given me over the years well and truth be told i've always even though i'm older than you i've always looked up to you and admired mm -hmm. your uh your, your passion and j just your uh, just your drive you know I know, I know you get some of it, honestly, but, uh, you know, you've gone and done beyond what, uh, what I ever thought you, what I ever thought you would do. I knew you, I knew you was going to be good, but damn, I didn't know you was going to be this good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thanks for continuing to push me to, 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 to continue. So I, I really do appreciate it. And, you know, I just, I just want to say to everybody, to the viewers, um, you know, just, just, uh, to keep pushing. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of work ahead of us and, um, and it's not going to be easy, but we, we can't let up. And so, um, yeah, keep pushing and, uh, um, rest in peace to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and all, and all that have lost their lives senselessly, uh, to, to, um, to violence, um, at the hands of law enforcement. Yeah. And, uh, how surprised are other brothers and sisters going to be when they see this, uh, debuted on our network. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll be really, they'll be really surprised. So. <laughs> yeah, all, all right, all right. Uh, obviously, uh, mom, dad, everybody's there. Your husband, your husband. I'm not gonna call his name out in public, but you know, tell him, I, tell him I say, I'll say hello, and I, I'll make sure I, uh, we send this out to all of all of the rest of our siblings. All right. Uh, you know, Roy, Roy, we can sit here and do this like we do our normal Sunday Zoom calls that we do, but. I'm going to let you get the final word in, Mr. CEO, since uh, this, this is your spot. <laughs> uh, well, first, again, I just want to say thank you to Ms. Walker for coming on and speaking with us and uh, providing us with the information and the things that, um, that she's done and she's been involved in. Um, you know, your brother, all right, but you, 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 you've upgraded the family status, so, you know. You <laughs> Doing some different things, but um, no, we, you know, again, as the network, we are in the process of um, of starting to be that voice. Um, our one of our taglines is that we are the future of urban media. Uh, we are the voice of Black America in this country, and we will be that. Uh, we have a, a very distinct and and direct mission that is to change the world by changing how we as Black people see ourselves, and then how other people see us. Because once we see ourselves differently we will start to act differently and we will start to expect more. Um, we are going to be very aggressive in the local pushing of politics and getting people more engaged in different things. Like I said, we've got a, a phase, three phase plan that's coming out. Of course, you can find our 12 point plan on Facebook. Now it's under the Jericho broadcast networks. You can also search for it under my um, professional page, which is Roy M. Evans, the second one man's mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, AD, thank you for, for for getting your sister on and and and, and providing that information because we'll probably look at like I said, she will be recruited into the uh, into the fold to be engaging in that. So we're looking forward. Time to me up. Okay. And, and, and don't forget, anytime you need to get anything out, you know, you've always got a voice here with uh with us. I don't have to be on. You know, you can contact us here at the network directly and be it with me or be it without me. You know, you've always got a an extra media outlet where you know you can uh you can get on we don't have to be on msnbc we'll we take jericho broadcast network instead that's good to me 
And with those notes for Roy Evans, for my baby sister, Cora Faith Walker, this is A.D. Drew, and we thank you for joining. Oh, by the way, please remember, like, subscribe, share, tell a friend, do whatever you need to do, promote this, uh, send, your, send your contributions to us. Uh, we definitely we definitely need money to help keep this uh, network going. Uh, you can you can get, you can send our cat send it to our cash app, but whatever you do, please like, subscribe, share at my BCSN at the number one on Facebook Jericho uh, broadcast on Jericho broadcast network. So once again for Roy Evans, Core Faith Walker, this is AD Drew, and we'll see you on the other side. It didn't. What happened was. Uh, a gentleman wanted to do the Black College Sports Network mm -hmm. in partnership with the HBCU for these black colleges. Yeah, absolutely. And it would have educated uh, the Black College Sports Network. This is what he wanted to do. That would have educated a lot of black kids. Mm -hmm. OK, that was the real reason why I got into it was when I saw what happened with the Black College Sports Network, which I. I have in me the ability to make you a better you. So if you work hard, focus, stay on point, you can do anything. Trust me. We made this track.